All right, everybody. Uh, today, I'd like to welcome uh, Mike Brill from uh, University of Loyola in Chicago in the uh, Department of Biology, where he's been an assistant professor for about five years. As you can see from his title, he can't, you know, his love of science can't be contained in just one kingdom. Uh, in fact, his uh, undergraduate degree is in zoology uh, from Michigan State University. Uh, he turned it around, though. Uh, and stay there to do a PhD in, in plant science and, and in the psychology and evolution and behavior program there. And that's where I met him, actually. Then he got a NSF postdoctoral fellowship uh, where he worked with uh, Katie Heath at University of Illinois Urbanish Champaign, uh, got interested in genetics of, of microbe interactions, and he's done sort of taken it in a, in a number of different exciting directions since then, which I'll let him tell you. Great. Okay. Thanks a lot, Chris. And it's been great uh, chatting with everybody today and, and visiting. So I'm excited to tell you about some of the things that uh, I've been doing. Um, real quick, basically, if you know anybody who's interested in going to teaching, whether they're a current student or a former student or something, send them my way. We basically have REUs for students going into teaching in the summer, the themes biodiversity. We also have a pretty large NSF grant to fund people like for change of career that already have a bachelor's in STEM to get uh, a master's in teaching. So you can actually, you know, you can check a lot of boxes with a career in teaching, right? So, um, and to be honest, we have trouble giving away the money. We have an April 1st deadline coming up. So um, definitely send folks our way. So here's a little bit about what I'm gonna tell you about today, sort of a few stories, things that I've been working on lately. The first is looking at the genetic basis of mutualism phenotypes. Uh, this is through a, a GWAS in the model legume Metacago. Then I'm gonna look at and talk about comparative population genetic structure between legume plants and their rhizobial uh, symbionts. Then I'm gonna sort of broaden this perspective and look at the broader microbiome of uh, the model legume uh, Metacago again, and then sort of uh, step back into uh, more nature and native legumes and looking at the role of plant soil feedbacks and what this might have on um, plant microbiome interactions. So mutualisms, you know, they're crazy diverse. They play important roles in all sorts of ecosystem functioning, right? They, uh, they're also just kind of charismatic and compelling. A lot of us got interested in biology because of really interesting and dynamic interactions and and they can be quite diverse, right? We've got like sort of this protective mutualism where this plant produces extra floral nectaries to attract ants, which defend it against, you know, herbivores. We have um, nutritional or, you know, cleaning mutualisms like these birds that clean ectoparasites off of uh, a zebra. We have, of course, reproductive mutualisms, right? Like plant pollinator interactions. And then what I've been focusing on, um, nutritional mutualisms, like between legumes and uh, nitrogen fixing bacteria that provide them with that important nutrient. So in general, in mutualism biology, there's a number of open questions. The one that's received the most attention is this, you know, how do mutualisms persist in the face of cheaters? So this idea that mutualisms should be sort of inherently unstable because cheater genotypes, individuals that take more than they receive could destabilize these interactions, right? And in response to this, so this is, you know, this classic idea that's still a, a, a vibrant research topic. In response, though, there's various stabilizing mechanisms that have proposed to maintain mutualisms. So things like partner choice, being able to discriminate amongst, you know, potential partners and picking beneficial genotypes over cheaters, sanctions, right? Limiting nutrients uh, to those uh, cheating genotypes, fitness feedbacks, things like this. Another big important question, um, which has received left, less attention is what maintains coevolutionary genetic variation? So here's a paper in evolution that Katie Heath, who's my postdoc advisor and John Stinchcomb published uh, a few years ago, kind of highlighting this, right? And identifying it as an evolutionary paradox. The idea being like, well, if there's fitness alignment, which people identify between host and symbiote, that should select for uh, you know, beneficial genotypes of each that are cooperative and limit genetic variation. But we see lots of genetic variation for mutualism traits, coevolutionary traits, and these can be maintained you know, locally, things like variation for cooperation, which today I'm going to think of as we call partner choice. 
Um, this variation can be maintained locally. And like I said, selection should erode that genetic variation. It's much like that broader question in evolutionary biology, right? What's maintaining genetic variation? So today I'm going to sort of talk about um, this question a little bit, focusing on two mutualism phenotypes, partner choice and then partner quality. That's what I'm going to tell you about here in this first part. And I'm doing this work in this classic mutualism between plants and the fabaceae, legume family, um, and bacteria that fix nitrogen. Right? So legumes, as you guys know, the second most important uh, crop family between the, behind the grasses. They play critical roles in biological nitrogen fixation. They're also incredibly diverse. The fabaceae is the third largest, most species-rich plant genus. I'm not going to talk about this work today, but this is a, a big area of focus for mine, really asking the question, how can a nutritional mutualism, this interaction with rhizobia or anna, contribute to diversification? Um, in general, plants interact with a limited range, and you know they're trading carbon for nitrogen, right? We're all familiar with this. The bacteria are housed in these nodules. They're really cool. I'm sure all of you have seen them, you know. They're kind of show kids. You can pull up a clover plant in your yard or garden. They're loaded with nodules like this, right? They can be pink because they're fixing nitrogen and that's like hemoglobin. And there's tons of bacteria in there. It's, it's really an interesting um, and tractable relationship interaction for studying microbial ecology too and plant microbe interactions. But plants interact with a limited range of rhizobia, okay? Whether those are, you know, you can think of them as species or genotypes, strains, or whatnot. Um, you know, certain plants interact with certain clades, and I'll talk more about that in a minute. The rhizobia, what's interesting, they sort of have two aspects to their life cycle. They can be free living in the soil, or they can live in association with the plant and the nodules. Very different environments that probably shapes their genomes. And I'll get into that a bit more later. And the rhizobia, the plants are essentially are monophyletic, right? They're all the same family. The bacteria can be really diverse and encompass both alpha and beta proteobacteria. So here you can't really see it, but in bold are the lineages that span alpha and beta proteobacteria that are can nodulate. Okay, so, so super diverse lineages. So these two traits that I've mentioned, partner choice, partner quality, a little bit more about them. So partner choice, again, the legumes, the rhizobial symbionts are not vertically transmitted, okay? A new plant, a seedling has to acquire new mutualists each generation from the soil. And these microbial populations and communities can be really diverse, all right? So there's this opportunity for partner choice. This caricature is kind of showing this. Maybe you have like in blue, say these are the better, you know, mutualists. Uh, the reds could even be like cheater genotypes, that type of thing. The plant has to, you know, decide which decide, right, uh, anthropomorphize it there a bit. They have to pick which rhizobia to associate with, all right? There's a suite of signaling interactions, molecular handshakes that go on that are fairly well characterized that govern this process. How we would measure this, well, in the lab, we measure this through multi-strain inoculations. We inoculate with multiple strains. We see which strains the plants associate with preferentially if they do. And the flip side, we have partner quality. This is like cooperation, right? So what benefits, fitness benefits, does the plant receive from association with a particular genotype of bacteria? So here, let's say this, you know, it's forming nodules with this blue bacteria, the clover plant gets really big, right? It's getting a lot of nitrogen, you know, per se. The red one, maybe this isn't as good of a mutualist, the plant's small, okay? So variation and partner quality. We measure this through single strain inoculations, all right? So that's kind of a little bit about how we do this. Um, now, there's variation for both of these traits that's fairly well documented. This is work that I've done in the model legume, Metacago, very similar to um, Metacago truncatula, similar to Arabidopsis, right? Small, annual, um, diploid genome, not too big, fully sequenced. There's knockouts and all sorts of molecular resources available, natural populations, too, that you can order from stock centers or visit in nature, that type of thing. Um, importantly, that it's uh, alfalfa relative, so it's an annual species in the same genus as alfalfa, Metacago sativa. Um, and there's, you know, evidence for partner choice and, and partner quality. So here's some work that I did. We're looking at these are three different plant genotypes. We grew them and inoculated them with three different strains of rhizobia. So the plants are coming from different fields in the native range. This is in southern France. And then the bacteria are also from those habitats, right? So you can see here these two 
plants, these plant genotypes, they associate heavily with the white strain. They don't form many nodules with the other strains, whereas this uh, genotype, CHAT1, forms lots of nodules with the dark strain. So variation and partner choice, right? Partner specificity. Now here I'm adding in partner quality. This is one of the strains that I showed you before. This is nodule um, occupancy, so partner choice. This plant forms lots of associations with the white um, genotype. But when you look at the partner quality, the plant actually has highest biomass with a different strain. So it's selecting, you know, forming associations with the strain that's not the best for it. Um, overall, um, you know, this is work again that my uh, postdoc advisor, Katie Heath, did. she looked at 12 genotypes of plants inoculated with those same three strains and finds evidence that plants overall are uh, forming more associations with the strains that they have the highest biomass with, okay? Um, but certainly there's some variation. So what I'm kind of been hinting at and want to highlight is to be adaptive, plants have to be able to select the strain that confers the highest fitness benefits for them, right? So this is a question that I'm really interested in. Um, and in this GWAS study that I'm about to tell you about, we were really asking, you know, is partner choice adaptive? We wanted to look not just at 12 genotypes from three sites, but kind of across the range, a lot of encompassing the genetic variation in the system. And then ask, you know, what do we know about the genetic basis of these two traits, partner quality and partner choice? And really I'm interested in, you know, we've been viewing and I've been discussing this as sort of two separate, separate traits. But maybe they're really the same thing, and these are just different ways of us measuring. But we should be able to decipher this from the GWAS, right? If, the, if there's a lot of overlap in the genetic basis between these two traits, well, then maybe they're really the same thing. If they're distinct, well, maybe they could be decoupled through combination or something, and this could lead to some of this mutualism variation that we're seeing in nature. So to do this, we did a genome-wide association study. Most of you are probably familiar with this, right? Um, so um, here, this is uh, highlighting the Metacago map, map population. This is a publicly available mapping population. There's, you know, about 262 um, lines, genotypes that span the native range of the plants. They've been selected to kind of minimize population genetic structures like the for genetic mapping. We have full genomes from a lot of them uh, and millions of SNPs available. So these populations have been genotyped. What I didn't tell you, it's important, like Arabidopsis, these things are essentially 100% self-linked, right? So um, each seed is essentially a clone of that genotype. So we don't have to re-genotype them. We can grow them under different conditions or treatments, just genotype them, and then do the mapping with the available um, SNPs. And of course, we're looking for something like this, like these Manhattan plots, right, for loci that are statistically associated with the particular with the trait. Um, and I'm going to be doing this in these two uh, for these two traits again through multi-strain inoculations and then separately through single-strain inoculations. Quickly, I want to highlight the people that did this work, especially my postdoc uh, Andreas worked on this, and uh, a team of undergrads, because thousands of plants and nodules were involved. Um, we did this work over a two-year period, all right, two different summers, uh, different mapping populations. So in the first year, we looked at partner choice. We did this again through the mixed strains. Well, which strains do we use? First, we took 50 uh, strains of rhizobia that I cultured from uh, plants from the native range. Okay, and we drew them on two plant genotypes and we looked for uh, G by G effects on, on biomass, so partner quality. We picked strains that sort of had contrasting effects. So I think we think this guy down here does really poorly on this plant genotype, but really well on the other one. And then I think that orange guy up there did really well in this genotype, not so well. Okay, so we used those two strains. We then inoculated 200 plant genotypes with an equal frequency of each. We then harvest the nodules. We harvested 30 nodules per plant. So that's about 6,000 total nodules. And then we genotype those nodules with the restriction digestion to ask, did they associate with one strain or the other? What's the frequency? And then we would use that to map. Okay, for mapping. To do this, you know, we amplify a symbiosis gene and then we digest it. We have a, a digestion marker, right, where it cuts in one strain, not the other. We grow these bacteria, we take a nodule and we uh, surface sterilize it. We put it into a two mil centrifuge tube, add 500 mils of culture, and then culture them in there. So we can culture in one like shaker thousands of nodules. Okay. 
and then you know run the PCRs. Um, we measured, and then in, so that was year one. That was the partner choice data. In the second year, the second summer, we looked at partner quality. So here again, we took the same plant genotypes. We inoculated them individually with either with each rhizobia. Okay, so there were two treatments. Um, we did five replicates of each, so there were you know uh, two thousand total plants. We grew them for the first ten weeks of growth. We measured a number of traits: uh, above ground, below ground biomass. A proxy for chlorophyll content using a SPAD meter, um, nodule number, and nodule size. Today, I'm just going to talk about most of these traits are correlated, and I'm just going to talk about above ground biomass. So, the first question, you know, is partner choice adaptive? Well, the answer is no, it's not adaptive. Here we have uh, this is the partner quality data. We're showing you the two different strains of rhizobia. Here we have relative biomass on this axis and then the strain frequency. There's no positive relationship, right? Doesn't really matter who they're associating with. So um, they're not able to like associate preferentially with the best strain, all right? This is across 200 some plant genotypes. Then we look for, this is partner quality. So we've mapped individually uh, GWAS, QTL, in, for each uh, rhizobium inoculation treatment. Um, and then, you know, there's, you know, you look above some statistical threshold. Here I'm highlighting in red, you know, this is for strain, we call it 141, 746. There's only two loci that actually um, co-localize are shared between inoculation with these two rhizobia. So a pretty distinct genetic basis, depending on which bacteria they're associated with. So there's a lot of like G by G variation between the genome of the plant and the rhizobia. Um, what are the genes? Well, here I'm just showing you kind of some. These are the genes that are shared uh, between the two um, is what I'm showing you in uh, red. Well, no, that's in general, um, I'm showing you the genes, right? This across different traits. In red are candidates that are involved in some biotic interaction. For the most part, there's not a lot of red. Some of these, you know, might be novel genes that are associated with interactions with rhizobia in this context. Okay. Um, partner choice, what did we do? Well, we mapped that, right? This is just the frequency of association in the nodules. Here you see more red. There's more candidates that you know, are known, which kind of makes sense. Nodulation has been studied quite a bit more. Still, there's a lot of other you know, putative loci that have been documented as being associated with this relationship before. Now, there's no overlap between, remember there are these two genes, right, that are uh, co-localized in both studies. Uh, neither of those two were found in the partner uh, choice uh, GWAS. Um, when we look at each, individual, uh, individually, each single strain inoculation individually, there were two, two loci that popped up as being overlapping between partner choice and partner quality for one of the bacteria, okay? But that's about it. And this is, these are the genes from the GWAS for just this strain 141. You can see again, quite a few of these are in red, are uh, known candidates, but not all of them. And then in green, we have those two that kind of overlap, all right? Um, these are, you know, a putative transcription factor. These potentially might be new players that haven't been documented before. So conclusions from this sort of first GWAS study, we're working on finalizing this data set and publishing it. Um, there's no evidence for adaptive partner choice, so for plants being able to pick the best strain for them. Um, and there's a largely distinct genetic basis between partner quality and partner choice. Meaning that these traits, you know, could be decoupled, right, through recombination or something. And this might explain some of the variation in these interactions that we're witnessing that's, uh, that's maintained even locally. All right. And then, like I've kind of been highlighting, some of these potential candidates could be novel and warrant maybe further investigation. So the next steps, you know, what we're doing right now is we're looking sort of at context dependency, trying to confirm the partner quality phenotype. So we're picking the high and low lines that did really well with one plant genotype, poorly on the other. We're regrowing them with greater replication, now aiming for 15 replicates per plant genotype to see if we can recover that same phenotype. We'll harvest those plants in another few weeks. And then, you know, if we wanted to, we could do functional validation, maybe ordering knockouts. Because as we know, we're doing a lot of multiple comparisons here with the GWAS. There's 2 million SNPs in this data site. 
set, you have all these pairwise, uh, you know, associations. So false positives can be a real problem. So just because, you know, I don't want to harp too much on, oh, this is a, a new gene, right? We need to validate it somehow. So, so maybe we could order, say, knockouts and see if we can recover the phenotype or some other validation mechanism. So stepping back to these questions, we know there's a lot of co-evolutionary genetic variation for these traits that can be maintained locally. Another um, reason factor that might influence that is geography, right? Might be very important. And we know that co-evolution is an inherently geographically variable process. You know, this has really been is most prominent from the work of John Thompson, what he calls the geographic mosaic theory of co-evolution, right? So there's sort of various predictions sort of from this idea is that there should be co-evolutionary hot and cold spots that vary across the landscape and potential mismatches between reciprocal co-evolutionary selection. This could, there could also be variable trait remixing due to differing levels of gene flow kind of across the landscape. And this gives rise to these selection mosaics. So this is sort of taking a meta population sort of viewpoint, right? So here we have what he considers a co-evolutionary hotspot. You have strong reciprocal co-evolution between both interacting partners. But in other populations, maybe there's only selection on one species. Maybe you have more like diffuse forms of selection. Selection could be absent. And then with these various arrows, he's kind of indicating that there's varying levels of gene flow, right, across this sort of spatial context. So all of this can manifest um, these selection mosaics. Here's a great example of this work, classic work from Butch Brody's group looking at uh, poisonous newts that produce tetrodotoxin resistance in garter snakes out west. This is from California. Here they're showing you like uh, resistance in the snakes and the toxicity in the newts, and um, they overlap. So if you see, you know, a blue blob, well, that means that, you know, you have low toxicity in the snake and low resistance in the newt. So that's or the other way around, whatever. The traits match, right? But if you have, say, like orange and green or something like here, you have a trait mismatch, all right? So this is sort of a classic study documenting these trait mismatches that might be, you know, reminiscent of what we would expect for like this selection mosaic. What's interesting, though, is, you know, and I talked a little bit about gene flow, but it's kind of surprising that people have really rarely looked at the underlying population genetic structure in a comparative context between host and symbiont. Um, so that's, uh, but this certainly, right, could play uh, a big role in especially giving rise to trait variation. So in general, if there's alignment in population genetic structure between the hosts and the symbionts, this could promote local specialization, local co-adaptation maybe leading to hotspots, trait matching, right? If there's misalignment, this could give rise to mismatches and variation in mutualism traits, the type of variation that maybe we see um, when we go and look at natural populations. So I wanted to look at this again in Metacago. So um, this is work I did during my uh, postdoc, we collected plants from the native range. This is in Europe. Um, we have uh, plants from uh, populations from uh, Corsica, mainland France, and then Spain. We had 192 plants from 12 different collection sites. We had a, a large number of samples, like 11 to 22 per site. We genotyped them with, you know, 20-some thousand SNPs available from RADSI. So here's just some of the places, right? This is in Corsica. You can see, you can't see much, but along the bottom on the floor here is like clover-looking things. That's Metacago growing, right? That's the Mediterranean Sea. Maybe Napoleon was drunk walking around here, who knows? That's me stumbling around. This is on the edge of a vineyard. Um, kind of cool places. Here you can kind of see these dainty little yellow flowers. There's the Metacopo flowers, plants growing here. Some variation in soils, that sort of thing. Um, overall population structure in the plants, what we find, we have this strong east-west division. And this is indicative, we see this in a lot of different species indicative of distinct glacial refugia okay during the last glacial maxima um so you have this east-west core division this is in the plant we then wanted to look at what's going on in the rhizobia so i cultured you know like thousands of well like a thousand um isolates from uh this population and these soil samples that i collected um here's kind of what they look like this is uh, me holding a 
a soil sample. So we collected from sort of the rhizosphere soil. So I'm holding a plant. This is a Medicaiva plant. This is the soil that we're collecting. We then take these soils back to, you know, Champaign and we grew them. Uh, we grew a sterilized seed on that soil and we track the rhizobia in that way. So we pull out the nodules, surface sterilize them, grow them on growth media. We get um, pure cultures. We re-inoculate them on plants to ensure that they can form uh, nodules. All right. It's interesting. So this picture actually was just on the cover article of Molecular Ecology, uh, one of many pictures last year of my hand. But I felt bad because this was the end of the trip. I didn't sample this way. I wore gloves. You know, we sterilized the shovel in between each data set. But at the end, I was like, oh, I should get a picture, you know, for, uh, you know, presentation or something. And we sent it in and a few other pictures for cover article, you know, consideration. They picked this one. So my hand made the cover article, but I felt bad. It's misleading. It's not, you know, not good aseptic technique or whatnot. Importantly, with rhizobia is we want to look at population structure, not just at the genome at large, but also specifically at the symbiosis genes. Um, what's interesting, this is a review paper um, looking at where in the genome these symbiosis genes are located. And they can be, you know, this is bacterial. This is showing a bacterial chromosome, right? Here we have what we think of as symbiosis islands, where it's like a, a cassette. There's, they're all adjacent to each other in the genome in the main bacterial chromosome. But they can also exist as plasmids, distinct symbiosis plasmids. So the strains that um, Metacago Association with in the genus Ensifer, or Cyanorhizobium, is what it was previously classified as, they have two symbiosis plasmids, PCMA and PCMB, where all of the genes required for nitrogen fixation and nodulation are located. All right, so we looked and we're going to look at population genetic structure for the main bacterial chromosome and then individually for the symbiosis plasmids. Um, and uh, it's important to know, I guess, well, I don't know about important, but there are two different uh, species of bacteria that associate with these plants. I pulled out what well, we ended up getting from JGI money to sequence full genomes. We have those from 191 uh, Melrodi. Uh, strains, and then we still have the Medicaid. Today, I'm just presenting the Malwodi data, which we published. Um, uh, we need to get to the Medicaid data. So here I'm looking at PCA and isolation by distance at these distinct genetic elements and then in the plant. So here's the plant right down here. This is basically the data I showed you before, but, you know, PCA. So there's, again, uh, the colors here. Spain is in purple. France is orange, Corsican green. So you have strong distinctions, right, in PC1 here between Spain and, you know, east-west. So that's what we saw before. I was showing you with the pie charts. There's also indication for significant isolation by distance. We see isolation by distance in the main bacterial chromosome up here, but distinct clustering, right? Um, in this case, Corsica green kind of stands out as more distinct from mainland uh, Spain and France, okay? So it's sort of a distant distinct clustering pattern, and um, but there's still significant isolation by distance. There's no significant isolation by distance. Here we're comparing geographic distance versus uh, genetic distance, right? Uh, for the two different PCIMs, there's no signature for that. So we have distinctions in clustering from our PCAs among the chromosomes and the plants, not really for the, the PCIMs where the symbiosis genes are located. And then again, significant isolation by distance for the plant and the main bacterial chromosome not for the symbiosis genes. Here you can kind of just see these pie charts showing the different structure groups. Don't want to spend too long on this, but this is the plant. Again, these east-west divisions, some variation like on Corsica. This is the main bacterial chromosome. Corsica is more in green here. Mainland, there's a lot of purple, right? For the PCIMs, it's kind of all over the place. PCIM B, and you've got basically uh, one unit here on Corsica, but that purple shows up kind of everywhere. Same thing for PCMA. All right, I don't want to get into this too much, but we look at the evolutionary history, okay? So we're building phylogenies for these three different genetic elements. We've kind of color-coded the, the, um, the topology based on where the strains were collected. All right, so orange is where Corsica is. So this is the main bacterial chromosome. All the Corsica samples are in this one clade. On the outer ring, we show the, the plant genetic structure, okay? Basically, the take-home is you have distinct topologies when you're comparing the his evolutionary history of the PCMs versus the chromosomes. So potential, so they're experiencing, you know, different evolutionary histories. Maybe there's a lot of uh, horizontal gene transfer, that type of thing going on. 
Um, again, the main chromosome has more of the genes for living in, you know, all the metabolic and physiological functions in these bacteria, free living and association with the plant, that type of thing. The symbiosis uh, plasmids have the nitrogen fixation genes, the nodulation genes. So overall, you know, the uh, rhizobium genome showed high local with insight variation. I guess I didn't really, I, I took that part out, but there is. Uh, there's isolation by distance um, in the bacteria, but especially, you know, not really. Um, well, the bacteria genomes show high with insight variation. I guess I did mention that. Um, little isolation by distance, you know, just for the chromosome, not for the PSIMs. Um, PSIM A and PSIM B are more similar to each other, but they're distinct from the bacterial chromosome. Uh, evolutionary history and the plant. So overall, there's a discordance in the population structure at all these genetic elements and the plant. So this could give rise to trait mismatches and hinder local uh, coevolutionary reciprocal selection. Okay. Um, next steps, you know, we're working on the Medicaid and other genus. And then, you know, I'll point out that. Um, Metacondo is pretty weedy, right? It's not really a great ecological model. I mean, it'll grow like clover and cracks in the sidewalk. So uh, maybe it can just get everywhere and find a rhizobia and it doesn't really care. Um, we're following this up with a more native and natural uh, system. So this is Astragalus. I'm not talking about it today, but it's the largest genus of plants. There's like 3,000, all plants, um, 3,000 some species, more than basically all mammals. Um, it's a legume, right? So we're looking at comparative population structure between a particular species and its bacterial symbionts to see if this pattern of discordance holds up for a more uh, ecologically relevant system that shows a lot of like habitat specialization. Okay, so that's kind of where we're going with this work. Uh, in the next part, you know, I'm take want to take a more broad view of plant microbe interactions and expand beyond interactions with rhizobia because we know that you know plants interact with an incredible abundance and diversity of microorganisms right fungi uh, bacteria protists all sorts of things and we now know you know that uh, interactions with the microbiome mediate to some extent interactions with the environment right with stress biotic or abiotic aspects of stress right they can impact even traits like flowering time obviously resistance to pathogens right uh drought tolerance in some cases um so microbiomes are are really important uh in the case of legumes what i want was really interested in and kind of how i got into this was asking what role do rhizobia play in the context of the broader microbiome so the first thing we did, again, in Medicago, we did a um, microbiome study, really asking, you know, what's the role of plant genotype and soil origin? What role do they have in structuring the microbiome across different plant tissues or compartments, as we call it? So looking at the rhizosphere, the soil that's tightly associated uh, close to the plant, to the roots, the nodule, the endophytes in the nodule, what's in that community besides rhizobia, in the root endosphere, and then phylosphere endophytes as well. Um, we did this with three different plant genotypes, one from Corsica, mainland France, and Spain, from distinct genetic clusters, and we grew them on two different soils, one from Spain and, and France. We looked at, um, and we did this with 16S amplicon sequencing, which a lot of you guys do here. Um, I'm not going to show you most of that data today, but I just want to show you these stacked histograms because one thing pops out. Here we have these different uh, compartments, right? The rhizosphere, the root, the nodule, the leaf. Right away, you can notice there's lots of blue guys, okay? Well, in the nodule, the blue guys, that's rhizobia, pensifer. Used to be cyanorhizobium. I listed it in the other slides as cyanorhizobium. But anyway, they're the dominant bug, like 80-some percent of the OTUs in the nodule. And there's other stuff. We kind of expected this. We were curious who these other guys were. But what really floored us and, you know, we published this in Microbiome, a you know, decent journal. What really kind of elevated it was that um, we found rhizobia everywhere we looked. Not only did we find it, but it was the dominant bacteria, even in the leaf. So this really raised the question, like, these rhizobia are everywhere. We were surprised to see this. What are they doing? You know, or do they have any functional role in there? Are they the same strains that are in the nodule? Are they just getting everywhere? Does the plant just say, oh, this is a good guy, you know, they hold back the innate immunity, or maybe are these specialists 
that are good at getting into leads and they can't fix nitrogen, that type of thing. So what we did was shotgun metagenomic sequencing, comparing genomes from the nodule and then the root endophytes. And we looked specifically here, I'm showing you um, genomic content from the symbiosis plasmids from both of them. And there's no distinguishing, they're the same in the nodule versus the, the in the root. So outside of the nodule, but in the root hemisphere. This is um, for piece MA and piece MB. So um, it seems that, you know, again, these aren't distinguishable, that these rhizobia, that they're the same isolate, you know, the same strain, the same OTU that's in the nodule, it's getting everywhere in the plant. It's presumably capable of nitrogen fixation, right? Um, but what's interesting is we also find other rhizobia taxa in our microbiome analysis. So this is the genus rhizobium, which associates with like clover or trifolium, right? It's a fairly dominant member of the microbial community in Medicago. Um, so, you know, maybe rhizobia, or at least particular types of rhizobia, they're, you know, commensals that are just good at getting into plants, right? Um, so, uh, Maybe, you know, like I mentioned, um, you know, Medicago is kind of weedy, right? Well, so is Ensifer, it's <laughs> rhizobial symbiote. It's actually fairly closely related to agrobacterium. So maybe it's just good at getting into plants, right? Where different types of rhizobia might be not that good. Even in Arabidopsis microbiome studies, they find Ensifer at fairly high levels, right? Clearly, Arabidopsis doesn't form associations with, with um, nodules, at least. Right. So um, maybe it's, you know, this finding is a quirk of this particular rhizobial symbiont. Maybe that's something to do with our experiment. We drew them in, drew them in these magenta boxes, which were enclosed because these are like European soils, right? So they had to all be contained. So the soil was live soil from the field, but their plants are, aren't exposed to the air, that type of thing, especially for the leaf tissue, right? We were really surprised that the rhizobia was the dominant member of the the phylosphere. Well, the phylosphere tissues are largely colonized through the air, and this was enclosed, you know, in a growth chamber. So maybe in the absence of that diversity of things that would normally colonize the leaf rhizobia, we have to become more abundant. So we wanted to know was this, you know, a quirk of our study system or not? And then, of course, the soils we looked at here were rhizosphere soils which have been experiencing plant soil feedbacks. And maybe just, you know, these plants have been growing there. The rhizobia are just crazy abundant. That rises to your soil. So, you know, they just, there's a lot more of them to find their way into the plant. Um, so we wanted to kind of step back and look at this role that plant soil feedbacks might take and look across different legumes, native legumes outside, that type of thing. So here's a picture. This is from Illinois Dunes uh, National Park. So, you know, not too far away. These are lupins. You know, this was taken a few days ago. And here's a patch, right, of lupins. And a lot of legumes are patchy like this. They have patchy distributions. They grow here. You can see these yellow guys. I don't really know what they are, but like they're kind of everywhere throughout the field, right, through this prairie. Um, just kind of randomly distributed. Whereas the legumes, there's a patch here, there's a little patch there, and that's it. They produce a lot of seeds, right? Presumably seeds are dispersing, you know, all over nearby, but they're failing to establish. So one idea might be, you know, this is plant soil feedbacks, right? We know that plants can modify both abiotic and biotic aspects of the soil and the rhizosphere that they're growing in, right? So if a seed lands, you know, here, there's probably a lot of rhizobia within the patch due to these, this history of plant soil feedbacks. They can form a rhizobia and you know get established. Maybe there's not as many rhizobia further away, or maybe there's rhizobia, but maybe the broader microbiome is distinct due to this history of plant soil feedbacks. And people have been really interested in plant soil feedbacks for a long time, but they haven't really considered. And we know that the microbial community probably responds to plant soil feedbacks, but we haven't studied the actual impact on the microbial community. So actually profiling these communities in response to history of plant soil feedbacks. So that's what we wanted to do. Did I... <clears throat> we, uh, well, first, here's just an example. This is from Missouri Fuzzy Bean, a native in our part of the world. We grew it on different soils. So this is from, um, we have just a common soil where the plants weren't growing. We had plant soil feedback soil, we call it, from 
the rhizosphere where a plant was growing. And then we went like 100 yards away and grabbed soil where no plant was growing. This is just looking at um, nodule number here. And here we have biomass. So right in the patch where the plant's growing, they form lots of nodules. Yay, you know, probably due to this history of plant soil feedback. Next to no nodules nearby, you know, when we go miles and miles away, this is from my campus where none of these guys are growing. This is in the city, basically the same number of nodules. And then there's consequences for biomass. This is after like two months of growth, right? They get really big, they're happy, probably getting lots of nitrogen on their plant soil, feedback soil. Even though they formed a few nodules here, right? Like a hundred yards away, the biomass is way less, okay? so. You know, yes, they're able to form some nodules. Are they the right bacteria or not? Of course, it's not just the rhizobia. It's this whole microbial community that might be different. So we wanted to get at this. We picked, and this is work that my master's student, Kian Dotson, did. Here he's collecting desmodium in a prairie uh, in, in Illinois. Um, so we wanted to know, are rhizobia dominant members of the microbiome, like we found in the Metacago study in the lab, right? Is that like a general feature of, you know, sort of like in biology? And then, like I've been talking about, how do plant soil feedbacks impact the microbiomes of these legumes? So we picked five native legume species and then two naturalized legumes. So a Metacago congener, Metacago lubolina, which grows here in your yards, and clover. So European species that are naturalized. And then five native legumes to this part of the world. Um, all, each of them are in a different genus. They use plant genus. They use very different rhizobia. Okay. Um, uh, it's a mix, the native species, well, all of them, of uh, species that have real patchy distributions, like lupins, that was one of our uh, species we use, and some that are less patchy, okay, that kind of just grow everywhere. Um, the first thing we did was we, well, the first lane of sequencing, we looked at sort of the bulk soil, and the rhizosphere soil, so just the soil communities. We looked at soil um, from the rhizosphere and then nearby, we went like 100 yards away, right? Um, we grew the plants outside, so we collected those soils, grew them in pots uh, outside for like two months, and we did 16S sequencing, right? Here's just some of the data, what we find. So these legends suck, but bear with me. This is the plant soil feedback soil, so from the rhizosphere. This is the soil 100 yards away. So this is for Camacristo, one of the species, and this is Desmodium. See, these are two natives. You can just see the soil that's experienced plant soil feedbacks, the distribution of the communities looks different than 100 yards away. Don't pay attention to rad, well, kind of, that's other. So that's not one OTU, right? That's everything else that's at low abundance. Here we're showing you the top 20 OTUs, okay? So you can see like, for example, in the soil nearby, you get lots of this green guy, right? But also the pink berries, that type of thing. Same thing here for Desmodium, you know? It's actually sort of the opposite effect in the Desmodium, and this is the same, uh, no, no, don't pay attention to the colors. They mean different bugs in different studies, okay? It just happens that there's a lot of this guy here, not there. But then look at Metacago and, and uh, Clover, our naturalized species. Just looking at the top 20 OTUs, the community looks really similar from the rhizosphere versus further away. And I'll tell you, the other three natives we looked at looked at like this, where you have real distinct sort of profiles in the communities between... Um, the rhizosphere soil and the nearby soil, okay? And then, but you don't see it for the two naturalized ones. Um, here we're looking at MDS plots, looking at great Curtis dissimilarity, right, in these communities. Here you can see they're color-coded by the plants, like Camacristus here. The circles are the plant soil feedback soils, and this, so like the rhizosphere, this is the nearby soil. So distinctions in the communities, really distinct for the natives. But up here we have trifolium and metacago and red and white red. There's a lot of overlap. There's no distinction in the community, you know, for those nat uh, naturalized species. Here we're looking at diversity metrics right, for these rhizosphere soils. Um, looking across the plant tissues doesn't really matter the the, the metric we look at, but basically um, there's distinctions in diversity between the the rhizosphere and the nearby soil for most of these species. The direction might change. Like in some cases, the plant soil feedback soil is more diverse. In other cases, the, the nearby soil is more diverse, right? But there's significant differences, but there never really is for the um, naturalized species. The other one that's not significant here is Amphicarpo, which is hog peanut. It has a less patchy distribution. It's more of an edge kind of specialist 
You find it on forest edges, just kind of everywhere. If you're walking along a, a trail, you just, oh, here's one, here's one, you know, they're not as patchy. Um, and there we don't really see distinctions in the community. Individual bugs, sure. Um, so interesting, you know, rhizo, oh, and I forgot to mention, but I was showing those stacked histograms. Rhizobia for none of those were dominant members of the rhizosphere, okay? So next what we're doing is we're looking at the internalized plant tissues. And I, we just got this lane of sequencing back for the root endosphere, the nodule, and the leaf. And at least what we've looked at so far, the metacago data, when we drew them outside was in trifolium, they look like the old metacago data, where the rhizobia are even in the leaf, they're getting all over. But we have some issues with sample size, but in the rhizobia, or in the natives, not so much. The rhizobia aren't as abundant. So again, maybe it's a quirk, though. The trifolium clover, so its rhizobia is in the genus rhizobium. It's sort of one of these common commensals that pops up in micro microbiome studies from all sorts of plants, corn, you know, Arabidopsis, whatever. So does Ensifer from Medicago. So maybe it's a quirky, you know, uh, uh, aspect of the biology of those particular bugs. Whereas like Brady rhizobium, Mesa rhizobium, other clades of rhizobium and the natives, they're not getting everywhere, it seems like. Um, but plant soil feedbacks can impact the microbiome communities of these natives, maybe not for the naturalized species. And why I really like this too, it's, it's a nice kind of natural experiment. You have something like a lupin, seeds are dispersing like 100 yards away, right? That's probably happening. It's really ecologically relevant. But, and we showed our biomass data when we grew plants on that soil nearby, biomass was, was way low. Well, Legumes are actually most diverse in desert and really arid environments, like sandy soils, like Astragalus, this other group I studied. Um, but even here, a lot of these legumes grow in sand prairies, that kind of thing. Um, they have really poor establishment if they don't, you know, especially if they don't have their rhizobia, but just the biomass is lower. If establishment is really low and you're in a really harsh environment, you know, they might not be able to get established. I mean, like the biomass is really low if the right microbes aren't there. They might not be able to get established here even, or maybe the soils aren't bad. They've got to grow quickly to compete with grasses for life, that type of thing. So maybe, you know, the this these microbiome shifts are contributing to the patchy distributions that we see in some of these guys. Um, uh, so yeah, potentially they could impact and restrict plant establishment. So the next steps were sort of, you know, that was just profiling this history of, you know, shifts in the microbiome in response to plant soil feedbacks. Next, we want to, we're, well, we had another treatment where we grew plants on those soils and then looked, can they quickly turn over their microbial communities? And the answer seems to be not really, at least for the, the natives, um, but we're getting more data on that. And then, you know, like I said, we're look, starting to look at the microbiome with these other tissues. Another thing we're doing is we're looking, especially because at least in some cases, rhizobia tend to be dominant members of the microbiome. We really want to know what role do they have in micro micro interactions and structuring those interactions in the broader microbial community. So my master's student Kian is doing microbial network analysis to kind of ask, are they microbial hubs, right? Um, so that's kind of where we're going with this. So again, there's a lot of people I want to thank. In the last quick minute, I'll tell you about, I've talked to some people about this, where I want to go in the future is sort of connect these things, where I want to do, um, and I've been putting this in as a proposal, to um, do a GWAS to map the genetic basis of microbiome variation in Medicago. And then ask, do any of the loci that we find, are any of those genes involved in plant pathogen interactions? Are they involved in known symbiosis genes, right? So really getting at this aspect of, you know, does the symbiosis genetic machinery also confer interactions with the broader microbiome? You know, one of the classic genes that I've talked about with some of you today is this Domi-1, does not make infections one. Because it's involved, actually, the mutants don't form nodules. They also don't form associations with AMF. So this is part of what we call the common symbiosis pathway, okay? So a set of 12 genes that are essential for both association with AMF and with rhizobia. What I want to do then is take and order mutants from all steps of this pathway and ask, we know these things call, confer interactions with and govern interactions with, with rhizobia and AMF. Do they also impact the broader microbiome? 
So trying to get to the genetic basis of microbiome variation and looking at what might be the connections to known biotic interactions, whether it's plant pathogen, you know, genes or, or single osis genes. So that's kind of where I want to head. Just want to thank a lot of people, especially my postdoc Andreas and then um, grad student Kian, lots of undergrads and folks in my lab and funding from various sources. So with that, I'm happy to ask, answer any questions. Now. Question. Yeah. So just thinking about cheating, is the relationship always the same regardless of conditions? I mean, under some conditions, is it a bad deal for the bacteria or plant, or is it relatively stable? I think it's fairly, I think it's fairly, um, if you have a, it kind of depends on the genotype of the plant, right? So there's a lot of genetic variation. Some rhizobia could be great mutualists for some genotypes, not for others. I kind of showed you some of that data. Um, in terms of partner choice, that's governed by signaling interactions, right? Um, molecular handshakes, like I call them, and vectors and all sorts of things. Those are really stable. Like the data I showed you, we, we grew them in different nitrogen levels. Cause like the idea was like, oh, if there's high nitrogen available, like in the environment, they're going to maybe ask less and be less choosy, right? And the answer is no. Those signaling interactions are really stable across environments. Partner quality, it, it probably depends quite a bit. Um, but I don't think it's been tested that well. I think, uh, I mean, some some strains certainly seem to be really crappy mutualists. I don't know if you'd call them cheaters per se. It can be really hard to find cheater genotypes actually that where the uninoculated plants do more poorly, right? But you can find kind of some. But they seem to be poor across all of them. And the idea is maybe they're just really not efficient at fixing nitrogen, right? So I think it kind of depends. Yeah. Sorry, sure. question on that a little bit. Like the, so if the plants aren't doing a great job of keeping their best uh, rhizobium, is, is there how passive or active are the Rhizobium genes in that situation. Maybe the, the rhizobium may not be that great at being a symbiont, but maybe they're, are they being really good at convincing or, or establishing themselves in nodules? Is that? Yeah, you could imagine it could be different strategies, right? They're really good at getting in, but maybe they don't confer as, as many benefits. Um, I certainly think some do that for sure. I think one confounding thing is. And people have done experiments to kind of get at that stuff. Part of the problem, and I'm trying to wrap my head around this, is when we inoculate and do these studies, we're inoculating with such an incredible density of bacteria that I wonder how artificial some of these results might be, right? Because, you know, in a pot in the greenhouse, we inoculate with liquid media, you know, probably milk, we dilute it and make them equal concentration, all that. But they form, they can form, you know, a hundred nodules. You know, a little plant in the field is never going to have that many. You know, and I haven't seen data like that published anywhere, but I thought about kind of putting that idea out there. So, so I think that sort of can be a confounding effect, these density kind of impacts, you know, and maybe, because um, maybe, you know, these poor ones, maybe they're at lower density in native soil. So, I, so I guess that's not answering your question, but sort of a caveat. I've been thinking. Whenever I've thought about sort of doing experiments like this, and when I see people that do experiments like this, my sort of approach as because we sort of started this asking like, okay, what role do rhizobia have in structuring interactions in the broader microbiome? One thought was to use a synthetic community and of cultured bugs and add in rhizobia, yes or no. And I still want to do that, but I haven't gotten to it. But the approach I've kind of thought was, well, I can grow, I can go out in the field. And like I showed you, and collect soils that have where plants form lots of nodules. And I can go nearby where they don't form maybe any nodules in some species. So probably there's way differing numbers of rhizobia in the soils. But the physical and chemical properties of the soil are probably similar. Probably the starting communities are pretty similar, right? So I can sort of titrate and have treatments with different levels of rhizobia, and then maybe ask, are they does that shift? The microbial networks, right, the interactions. So that's sort of, yeah, 
one way I've kind of got of trying to think about this density kind of issue and what, what's a natural sort of abundance. Yeah. So you've done a nice job looking at the biological components of the soils, and you're assuming the soils nearby are similar in chemical composition. So never looked at that because there could be differences in pH, moisture. Uh, I don't know what else. Uh, there could. I mean, like, I bet they're not super big. I mean, you have different plants kind of growing there. But I mean, I showed you, like, they're, we, we do our best to kind of pick soils that look similar. But you're right. And for this, we only picked one soil. We have one rise. You know, our, our, our trade off, our thought was more plant species and, you know, less replication, well, no replication within species. But now what we want to do, at least for the biomass data, for the plant measurements, because it's expensive to do, you know, all this sequencing, is to go out, and we're planning on doing this summer, is collect soils from kind of all over and then grow greater replicates of the plants on them to measure biomass. And yes, it would be really good to look at just some of the easy things, if nothing else, like, okay, you know, what, how does nitrogen, total nitrogen vary or, or pH and things that you can measure just profile. But I think like in general, I mean, you know, it's a field of, you know, it's a sand prairie. It's more similar than not, right? We're not going miles away. It's just, and I think that regardless though, seeds are being dispersed, right? Nearby, probably frequently. So that's the environment that, and the, the level of environmental variation that, you know, seeds are dispersing in and have to deal with. So, um, you know, some of these things have really patchy distributions, you know, something might be, must be driving that. Yeah. But what would be interesting then though, is to say like, okay, take that soil then use like a soil slurry to kind of maybe say, can we inoculate with like the community from nearby in a reciprocal way? Yes. Yeah, kind of jumping off of that, in this plant soil feedback that you're thinking about, what do you imagine is starting in the loop? Do we get seeds moving to a new location? Plants don't establish very well, but live there a little bit and build up the microbiome in the rhizosphere, or is there stochasticity in where the rhizosphere is already and the speed seeds have to distribute there and find the best patches? I don't know. It's it's really interesting. I think that um, there's probably a lot of stochasticity, right? Maybe on a good year where it's pretty wet or there's an open patch where there's not a lot of grasses to compete with or something, a plant can get established. And I mean, it's been documented that you can have turnover and shifts in these communities pretty quick, like within a season, right? But I think what I would argue and probably need to collect to measure data on is that plant that the early, we only grew these plants for like, you know, six weeks, 10 weeks, but I think those early fitness benefits, you know, and costs are really important, you know, because if they don't make it and if the microbes aren't there, I think, I keep saying, I think establishment's really low, and, you know, so I think we need to collect data, but who knows, you know, like over time, they haven't gotten anyone. Right? Something like Rubens is still really patchy often. Some fields you go into, they're all over. So that'd be another interesting sort of comparison, right? But yeah. So when you were talking about um, rhizobia being found in leaves and things like that, is there any evidence in seeds? So uh, that you could maybe take your own uh, I think rhizobia with you to wherever you land, and then no, that's been looked at, I think, pretty extensively, right? So, there's so no evidence of that, yeah. I mean, I think if you had like a really muddy seed or something, but um, but yeah, I, you know, so so often, like if you whatever order seeds, they come with like an inoculum packet, right, or something, mm -hmm. but yeah, in the same vein, I'm, I'm curious, it's always amazing to see how many different microbes find their way into parts of the plant. Like, you know, how do you think that these other hitchhikers get into those bacteroids and and or with so many rhizobium in the plant itself, do you think they can uh, initiate like a bacteroid formation from inside the, the plant tissue? I know there's a whole signaling pathway with the fine root hairs, but is there any like any evidence of that that's happening? No, like are, you know, are they getting in and then just moving through the vascular tissue? Like, you know, they're they're all over the, pl the plant, right? At least the rhizobium in this study. So I suspect, especially in the closed container, like they, you know, they're moving up through the, the vascular system, I think, because there's not much airflow in there or anything. And, you know, but. When do you think the opportunity for other microbes is to get in there, though? That's kind of 
would let me, I think, that. Like how they get in? Yeah, because the root hair is pretty small, and it's like that infection thread is pretty cell width. Like, are they following along in the munching style, or like where do they come from? Yeah, I think they're getting in, you know, above ground, they can get any type of wound or anything, or fracture in like cell wall integrity, that type of thing. I think certain dermal layers are like, like especially for like AMF, right? There's certain cells where like AMF can penetrate that have less, I think, thick cell, uh, like the cuticle layer, that type of thing in the root. So I'm not exactly sure on, on a lot of this stuff, but certainly they get in, right? Um, in, in various mechanisms. They have to overcome the plant native immunity and whatever type of physical barriers too that have for going on. But there's, but reliably we see distinct communities within plants, right? Even grown in different soils. Like they're certainly filtering their microbial community and governing what gets in, you know. All right. Any other questions? I'm sure Mike would be happy to entertain a few more questions. Let's leave here today. Thank you.